first speaker today is Scott Schluter. He is a senior fish biologist at the United States Fish and Wildlife Service's New York field office. He also serves as the program manager for Fish Enhancement Mitigation and Research Fund, resulting from a hydropower relicensing settlement with the New York Power Authority. He began fisheries work in 1995 and has been a federal biologist for 25 years. Welcome up. So good morning, everyone. Um, you know, I'm really pleased to be here and, and thank you for uh, caring enough about the river to be here on a Saturday to hear more about it. Um, what I'm going to talk to you today about is American eels. And um, I think they're one of the most fascinating species we have in the river. I see the River uh, Institute folks here that do a lot of eel work nodding. Um, what I'm going to present is a real high, oh, I'm sorry, a real high overview of the research and conservation efforts we've, we've been up to. I want to highlight uh, Justin Eckert. Um, Lauren mentioned what FEMREF stands for, uh, this Fish Enhancement Mitigation and Research Fund and how it was formed. Justin is my other half. Uh, we have a two-man team. So this slide here is complicated and we could probably spend the whole talk talking about it. And this is the fascination of eels, right? So on the left here, the left figure, you can see in purple, um, that's the, the range extent, right? From the Canadian Maritimes along the entire coast of the US and this map isn't actually accurate. They continue down through Central America and the north coast of uh, South America to the Orinoco River Basin in Venezuela. Um, so they occur uh, historically uh, anywhere there was access to the Atlantic. Uh, let's jump over to this second figure on the right here, and this is the, uh, uh, the life history of the eel, essentially, in all the life stages. So initially, um, the first cut here is this vertical line. Everything to the left is oceanic. Everything to the right is continental waters. Um, so if we start on this circle somewhere, let's look at a yellow eel. Um, so this is the... Um, kind of growth phase of an eel, right? If anyone in here has seen an eel, odds are it was a, a yellow eel. Uh, these are the ones that um, essentially are in the river uh, growing up uh, to maturity. Uh, when they mature, they transition to what we call a silver eel. And a lot of physiological changes happen uh, to prep them for that saltwater migration. Their eyes get bigger, uh, their pectoral fins, the side fins grow, their swim bladder changes, and they, they leave their tributaries um, and come down to the Sargasso Sea area. Um, and the really interesting part is when these little guys leave the Sargasso and, and head back to streams, right? We're not really sure what, but they have a little odometer running, right? So they know how long it took them to get there and when they have to leave, they have a synchronous um, arrival on the Sargasso Sea, which is absolutely stunning. So they arrive there, spawn February, March, uh, and then die. So back to the life cycle here, we have eggs. Uh, they hatch into these little leptocephalus larvae, which are like a little uh, clear willow leaf uh, shaped uh, larval fish. They ride the currents uh, and then at some point peel off and head toward the coast where they convert into these uh, or transition into these little uh, glass eels, which is a, they essentially looks like a little perfect miniature of an eel, but they're absolutely transparent. And these are the, the life stage that does most of the migrating upstream. They can climb up uh, wet rocks and, and have really incredible climbing abilities. And then as they grow and keep migrating, they get pigmented and turn into what's called an elver. Um, so where do our eels fit in that we see out here in the river? So our silver eels uh, out migrate uh, June to September timeframe, and they're, they're roughly 13 years old when they migrate. Um, and then the incoming, we don't see glass eels. Uh, we're too far upstream. So by the time they hit the Moses Saunders Dam and climb up the eel ladder there, they're five to seven years old and about 16 inches long. Um, so this life history strategy of, of being spawned in the sea, going into fresh water to grow, and then coming back to spawn in the sea is called catadromy. So it's that opposite of a salmon, right? That would do it in reverse. Uh, one of the other unique life history strategies is, is their panmictic, which means that across their range, they go back to the Sargasso, mate randomly, um, and then disperse on the landscape. So there's really no population structure. They're one population. Um, and again, seeing their obligate migrants, uh, obviously barriers could pose a uh, significant problem. So what are threats to eels? Uh, and again, the, the list could be uh, more inclusive than this, but habitat fragmentation. So we dam rivers. Uh, often eels can't get upstream. Um, so that obviously is habitat upstream of that dam that eels don't have access to. 
uh, fisheries, not here sp sp specifically in New York uh, per se, but um, fisheries target pretty much all the continental life stages. Turbine mortality is what we're going to focus on today. Um, there's non-native parasites, specifically a swim bladder parasite that um, basically burrows into the swim bladder um, and, and feeds on the swim bladder and uh, impairs their swimming ability. The usual uh, chemical contaminants are, are impactful. And then as Lauren mentioned, uh, climate change, right? That you think of this little leptocephali larvae that's really relying on ocean currents, right? And those change uh, could be problematic to those early life stages. So let's talk about upstream migration. Um, generally, we have upstream migration or passage uh, figured out. Um, and that's no credit to us, but the eels, right? They, they're able to, their climbing ability is impressive. So the eel ladders are species specific fishways that are at about a 30 degree angle, a little bit of water trickling through them and some substrate and they'll slither right up them. So on those ladders, we have optical eel counters, right? So we almost have a complete census of what gets over the Robert Moses Power Dam uh, and makes it into the upper St. Lawrence and Lake Ontario. So if we look here, for, for if you can't, I suspect you can't read these, but this level here is about 800,000. Uh, this peak here is 1.3 million. And everything in orange is the Ontario Power Generation Ladder. So this year is 1974 is when the ladder went in. So you can see these numbers were uh, pretty high and then a precipitous de decline. This inset is in 2006, uh, New York Power Authority, that aligns up with this part of the graph. They installed a fishway or an eel ladder on the US side. So now there's a ladder on both sides. So this precipitous decline from 800,000 or a million uh, bottomed out in 2001 at 944 eels. Uh, so we're looking at, you know, now we're bounced back to, you know, this is 20,000 here. Uh, this is, uh, the peaks are just over 50, right? So we're hovering there around uh, 25,000 or so. Um, so that's about a 90, 98% decline uh, in eel uh, in the St. Lawrence system. And again, if this was a normal fish that we could do some genetic work on um, and be able to tell there's different populations, uh, these would be listed federally. There's no doubt in my mind, right? But seeing they remix, uh, they, they don't have a, a distinct population structure. So we're you know, we're stuck with, uh, with that. So to, to give you a lay of the land, and I'm sure this is the most informed group I've ever given this talk to, but uh, Lake Ontario, we have the St. Lawrence going out. Uh, envision you're an eel on Lake Ontario and you head out of the river or out of the lake, down the river. Uh, you first hit Iroquois Dam, and then you hit the Moses Saunders Dam, and then the Baharnois Dam, and then it's a free shot out. So just some pictures, uh, here's Iroquois Dam. I'm sure most folks have seen it, but it um, is just a water control dam. So slabs of concrete get lowered down to detain water. Uh, there's no entrainment issue. Uh, fish don't get harmed going through it. And then as we go downstream, the next picture here is uh, uh, Moses Saunders Dam, half owned by New York Power Authority, half owned by Ontario Power Generation or OPG. And then downstream, just upstream of Montreal, we have the uh, Baharnwa generating station owned by uh, uh, Quebec Hydro. So this Jen Hayes of Natural Geographic supplied me with, and this is um, what we're dealing with. Uh, so this is turbine mortality, and it's horrific. Um, so what you're looking at here is a, a back eddy that um, eel carcasses are uh, accumulating, different stages of decay, and unfortunately, a couple fresh eels that are probably alive, uh, but injured uh, so badly that they're probably not going to make it. So what are we dealing with? So between those two main stem hydro dams, um, collectively, 40% of the outmigrating eels are killed by turbines. Um, and that, that number for, for hydros is low because uh, they're so big, right? So uh, on a smaller scale, a lot of tributaries, the mortality can be greater than 90% per dam, right? And some of these eels are running through six or seven of those dams. So it's an absolute gauntlet. Um, Another really unique thing that folks might not know is that every single eel in Lake in St. Lawrence and Lake Ontario is 100% female, right? And they're the largest among their range. So that in turn means they carry a lot of eggs, right? So John Castleman um, with, with the Ontario Ministry estimated that greater than 40% of the egg production that makes it to the Sargasso Sea historically came from the St. Lawrence and Lake Ontario. Um, so with that 98% reduction, um, you can see, a, um, 
a potential for range-wide impacts. And there's reason to believe that as a population shrinks, um, the recruitment to the extremities of the range might be impacted, right? So we might be seeing some of that as well. So how are we addressing this? Um, we formed what's called the Eel Passage Research Center, and this isn't a brick and mortar facility. Uh, it's on paper. Um, it's a collaborative approach between the utilities, so Ontario Power Generation, Quebec Hydro, and the Fish and Wildlife Service, really representing uh, and using uh, NIPA's money. Um, we went out and got Electrical Power Research Institute, or EPRI, on board to provide uh, uh, the facilitation role and, and lead the group. And we set up a, a technical advisory committee. Um, so all planning and research de decisions are done by that group. So here's the technical advisory committee team. And I should have set it up front that um, all this work, um, I'm representing this team, um, not Fish and Wildlife or myself individually. This is a, a joint effort. So what we have here is you know, the three hydros I mentioned uh, from the state and provincial perspective. We have the New York DEC. Uh, we have Ontario and Quebec uh, Ministries of Natural Resources. Uh, from a Fed level, we have the Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, Fisheries Oceans Canada. And then, uh, of course, EPRI. So this is about as legalese as we have. Uh, we sat down and wrote a long-term goal. Um, and I'll let you read it, but essentially it's to maximize the survival of eels at both power projects without significantly reducing power production. Um, so our, re our management objectives are essentially to concentrate eels, um, guide them and collect them essentially, and then uh, uh, demonstrate effectiveness of those selected methods. So our first term started in 2014, a uh, five-year term, and we were focused really on background information. So these are just covers of reports that we produced. Um, the first one being a, uh, a laboratory flume study where we were trying all sorts of different uh, uh, um, stimuli or cues. We looked at electricity, sound, flow enhancement, electromagnetic fields uh, alone and in combination to try to see if there was another uh, uh, kind of better mousetrap we could build to guide these eels. And then we took a look at three sonars and assessed them to see if we could put them on Iroquois Dam and see how eels migrated down without having to handle them, right? So we could put a stimuli in and see how they behave to it without having to touch an eel or tag them. Um, we did some fluid dynamics modeling at both projects, and then we did uh, two white papers, one on the effects of light uh, in guiding out migrating eels, and then one on uh, sound, the potential for sound to guide eels. And all these reports, if you go to the EPRI website, the epri.com, and, and the search window type uh, EPRC, all these will come up, uh, and they're free and fully accessible. So we were hopeful in that study to find another uh, uh, stimuli that would help us guide eels, but unfortunately, uh, um, it was only light, um, and to a lesser degree, sound that we identified as, as having a, a prospect for guiding eels. So all those reports on the previous slide, uh, we summarized in this paper we published in uh, 2021. And if anyone uh, is, is interested, uh, see me today and I'll, I can get you a copy. So now we had in hand of... Uh, um, you know, what we could try to guide eels with. The other piece that was missing was uh, we needed something to form the development and placement of this guidance structure in the river. So we needed the background information of, of the fish uh, to understand their migration patterns and their, uh, their timing of out-migration. So we tackled that in, in 2016 to 18. Uh, we tagged 345 eels from the Ontario Power Generation uh, Trap and Transport Program. They're all large eels, uh, like yellow eels, greater than 800 uh, millimeters. Uh, we released those fish off the, the fishery station, uh, OMNR's fishery station in Glenora. Um, and we installed fine scale positioning receiver arrays upstream of Iroquois, and then in the Baharnois Canal, uh, just upstream of the Baharnois generating station. So here's what we were looking at. Uh, Iroquois here on the left, Baharnois on the right. You can see the receiver arrays. Um, so these receiver arrays, we use them quite a bit for fish, and often they're put out in the river as a gate, right? So think of a, a ribbon at the end of a marathon. We know when a fish crosses it, right? So this is different. This is this fine scale positioning. So if you put these receivers out in a, a grid-like fashion, each one of them's pinging, right? So they have sync tags in them, um, and they're hearing each other. So basically, it, it spatially patches together a network. So when a fish comes into this thing and pings, it's heard by multiple receivers, and we can get precise location of fish. Um, so that's what was set up uh, for this project. 
So I flipped them on here on you here. So Baharnois is on the left, uh, Iroquois is on the right. But this is one year of example data. Um, so both both river sites are a little different. Uh, uh, Baharnois here is a big sweeping turn. Um, so fish have more of a, a direct uh, um, straight approach. And we found that 80% of the eels uh, pass through the center third of the Louis Gonzaga Bridge. And then if we look over at Iroquois, folks that know the river know that it makes kind of an abrupt turn to the north here. And you can see the eel tracks kind of follow that. And we found uh, that 66% of the eels go through 44% of the gates, right? So we didn't know if they approached in a shotgun fashion or if they were concentrated. So the answer is neither. Uh, we hoped they were a little more concentrated than they were, but they were not. So they both, um, the commonalities between the two, uh-oh, did you do that or did I? We're starting subtitles. <laughs> uh, that'll help maybe. Um, so anyway, uh, eels are, uh, what we found in the commonalities of both is they're avoiding those slower um, velocities in the river. And uh, on the U.S. shore, they're, you can't really see it here, but they're, they're really favoring this, uh, the U.S. shoreline. So if you look at a heat map, um, these are all the detections um, mapped in a heat map, and you can see they're kind of favoring that, uh, that U.S. shore. So one of the interesting finds I just thought I'd throw up here to show you, and, and just more to the remarkable nature of eels, is, uh, um, you know, we cared about what was happening at Iroquois and Baharnois, right? But we tagged these fish and released them here at Glenora. So essentially what this, what's plotted here are these points are uh, unique eels, the number of unique eels, and the more red, the more eels, right? So Glenora, uh, Glenora station here where we dumped them um, is obviously bright red because it detected every eel. So below Laharnoa, there's the ocean tracking network. So they have lines of receivers out for other species, right? Not related to our project. But we tagged these fish. We detected them at Iroquois and got the data we needed, but they all, the eels kept going, right? So we had nine eels that were detected at Iroquois that were detected at Cabot Strait, right? Um, so of that, that's about 1,000 miles. Uh, and it took them uh, se average 70 days to make that trip. And the real remarkable part is that at this point, um, they're not even halfway through their migration. So they would take a right turn here and go south another 1,200 miles or so. Um, so I think they, they make salmon look like wimps, I think. <laughs> so our second term, uh, knowing what we knew about eels and how they use the river, uh, was focused on, uh, that started in 2019, our second term, and ended just this past January 1. Um, our second term focused on the deployment and testing of a large uh, river scale uh, light guidance structure, basically building on the preliminary prototype that NIPA had done uh, during the relicensing. And of course, the COVID asterisks, right? Like everything in the world, um, COVID uh, turned us on our head um, with a binational team of staff and contractors. It was even more difficult. Uh, so we weren't able to pull off this study till 2022. So in 2022, we, we installed a 708-foot uh, 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 floating light boom uh, secured with anchors and chains upstream of the Iroquois Dam. We had surface-mounted lights that were angled downward to essentially create this wall of light in the water. And we had a randomized trial of uh, lights on and off. Um, so we had a control and a treatment uh, nights. And that boom was deployed August through December of 2022. And again, seeing I'm skimming over stuff, um, I don't want to lose sight of this, that, that silver eels are sensitive to light. Um, so if you look at their peak migrations, it's around the new moon or the dark moon, right? So they're, the sensitivity to light we're trying to use against them and use that light to, to affect their migration. So what do we do? We tagged 400 eels. Uh, we used eight, 180 kilohertz tags and receivers. Um, each one of the tags we put in had a little sensor on it that senses depth or pressure of water pressure. So it knows what depth it's at and it pings out a depth as well. So these tags were pinging every three seconds. Um, we use the same source for eels. This time we picked them, uh, cherry picked some larger fish at 950 millimeters. We were hoping that would increase the probability of uh, the fish migrating in the year of tagging. So we ran into some technical uh, challenges. Uh, we had to design a special receiver bracket uh, to be able to deploy these and get them back upstream of Iroquois. So that's this picture here on the right. Um, and we de deployed 27 of these out in the river to make this fine scale positioning array. So one of the most important things we did was we got Carleton University on, on uh, uh, hired on, uh, Steve Cook, uh, postdoc Chris Elvidge, and a master's student, uh, Cole McCloyd. 
and we got them on board to evaluate this behavioral response to our light field. Uh, the picture on the left here is awesome. It's uh, Cole McCloyd from Carleton and Dave Stanley from OPG. They're holding the biggest deal we caught, which was 11, 11 pounds, an absolute monster. People like big fish uh, pictures. Um, so here's what our array, um, the study site looked like. You can see there's a half a meter a second flow here on the, on the Canadian bank. And on the U.S. bank, we have about 1.2 meters per second of flow. The yellow dots represent those paired receivers on the bottom. Uh, you can see our, our angled light array. So the idea was that an eel would come down here, hit this wall of light, and ideally be guided. Um, we have some reference tags out in the system um, just to uh, provide some ground truth. Here's what it looked like from a drone shot looking down the length of the boom. So flow is actually kind of in this direction, right? So you can see that nice wall of light that we created. So where are we at? Um, Carlton, uh, hopefully at the end of next month, we'll have uh, the final report on the behavioral guidance. Um, the fine scale positioning data has been processed and there was a lot of it. So each one of those receivers had three and a half to seven and a half million detections on it. Uh, just gobs of data. Uh, we did the, the light field mapping analysis has been done. So the next few slides, I have three slides after this that are preliminary data that were produced by Chris Elvidge and Cole McLeod at Carleton. Um, but here are our preliminary results. So we had 209 of the 400 eels migrated, and that's not, so about 52%. Uh, that's not uncommon. That's what we saw in those three years prior, that only about 50% migrate the year of tagging at that size, and then the rest of them would go the following year. So of those, uh, we had 193 that we had enough data in our array that we could position them. So we had 144 that passed during the lights on treatment and uh, 49 that passed uh, during the lights off control night. So perfect 75, 25 mix that'll give us uh, a good comparison. So anyone that works on eels and I look back over at the River Institute folks knows that the only constant in eel research is they constantly throw you curveballs. So no other fish that I've worked on uh, surprises me like eels, and, and this study was no exception. So what we're looking at here are just three graphs of three unique fish, right? So to put it in perspective here, we have the Iroquois Dam at the top, our angled light array, a depiction of where that light field was, and these dots are fixes of that individual fish. So there's three fish here. Uh, the color coding scheme is depth. Um, so yellow is uh, within one to two meters of the surface. Purple is essentially at the bottom. Um, so if we look at each one of these, right, this fish came down, uh, interacted with our array, didn't like it, decided to, it dove a little bit, um, followed the receiver or the light field along and was guided. This one more, of, the middle one's more of a glancing blow, right? It, it interacted, didn't dive much, and just followed the, the light field right out. This one's a bit more complicated. It came down, uh, sensed our light field or something was up, dove, all the way to the bottom, kind of spun around a bit, decided, oh, I should keep following this light edge, um, popped back to the surface and carried on. So we hope to see a lot of this. Uh, the problem was that only about 20% of the fish followed this pattern. The rest did something else and back to that curveball. So this was typical, this, this was typical of most fish. Um, so they came down, detected our light field, dove to the bottom, skimmed along the bottom, got through our light field, popped back to the surface, and carried on. Oh, let me, oh, I can't go back. Huh? Yeah, so I was just gonna point out that uh, this is the importance of those pressure tags, right? If we didn't have depth here, uh, if we had a 2D study, we would have said, we're done. Like, this isn't gonna work at all. So this proves that we guided them, uh, just not in the direction we, we had hoped. So this is a cross-sectional pro profile of that same individual. Um, so over here on the left, we have the surface at zero meters. Um, down here, we have uh, 13, minus 13 meters. There's our light boom, the red box, uh, with the kind of light field we had going. Uh, the dotted line is the, the Iroquois Dam. So here comes this fish, right? It comes down, senses the light field, dives, goes under the light field, back up, and carries on. So our path forward, I'm wrapping up here, but our path forward, um, seeing our, our term two expired, we're working on a one year extension uh, to kind of catch up from those COVID delays. So we need that behavioral guidance report from Carlton 
Um, and again, that'll be hopefully done by the end of next month. We have a planned meeting uh, in early April with our tech, the technical advisory committee um, to review that plan and formulate our next steps for research. Um, and with that would come a development of a scope of work for the next five year term and an associated budget. And then with that scope of, scope of work and budget, uh, we're hopeful that a term three with EPRI and partners will start uh, January 1, 2025. So stay tuned, more to come. And I'll close with this team pick from uh, on top of Iroquois uh, with the light field in the background. Um, this is one of my biggest pleasures uh, as a biologist is working with this great group of people. Um, I will be around. Uh, we skimmed a lot here and, and took uh, liberties with what you know about eels. And uh, if uh, you have any questions, come see me here or follow up uh, via email. I'm always happy to talk about eels. So if there's any bit of time left, I'd take questions. These lights are awful bright, so I can't. Sir, go ahead. Yeah. Oh. No, I have not, and I've dreamt about it. <laughs> so, when I set, put that slide up and said that the, um, you know, we could spend a whole, uh, the whole day talk or the whole talk talking about that slide as the fascination, right? So, eels are so mysterious. There's we could talk for hours about the history of how folks found out what eels did, right? Like Aristotle thought they spontaneously generated from mud, right? Just because they're always there, right? Um, nobody saw an adult, right? As you think back in time, when we weren't as mobile as we are today, they're a mystery, right? You didn't have, you never saw a reproductive adult. Um, so that dot, that circled mark of the Sargasso Sea, a guy named Johann Schmidt, uh, back in, in the 19, early 1900s, spent 20 years uh, driving around in a boat and getting others to tow, well, they're running around on boats to throw out a plankton net. And he figured out the length of those little uh, leptocephali larvae they were catching. He was interested in European eel, right? European eel spawn in the Sargasso Sea as well. Um, so as he, as he put dots on a map of positions and the size of the fish, he deducted that that spot in the Sargasso is where they spawn, right? We don't know anything more since then, right? So almost 100 years later, technology caught up, that telemetry technology caught up, that Martin Kastengay um, at Laval University and his students used these big honking GPS tags, which were barely able to get on an eel, right? So they tagged adult eels and they ran out to sea. And he tagged, I think, 38 or 40 of them. And, and the idea is they would go some distance and the tag would release off the eel, pop to the surface and communi communicate via GPS. They had one eel um, pop off in the Sargasso, right? So in 100 years, that's as far as we've got. It's just, you know, these are a needle in a haystack here, right? <laughs> like once you get out in the ocean, it's a, it's a different game. I'd love to do it though. I hope you do it. If I hit the lottery, you won't see me. You can come to Bermuda. <laughs> Any other questions or are we up? Jeff. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, you're obviously uh, spot on and know where we should be headed, right? So the idea here is that if we came up, this FEMREF fund, a third of it was earmarked to come up with this means to guide, collect, and bypass eels, right? And once we come up with a solution, that gets handed back to New York Power Authority to implement, right? And we know it's going to be hundreds and millions of dollars, right, to do it. And at some point, you got to start thinking, well, these fish-friendly turbines are there. If we could put a fish-friendly turbine in, um, eels would go through, right, unharmed, 
and that'd be a one-time cost, right? There wouldn't be, even if, we, even if we built this infrastructure to guide eels and collect them and bypass them, the annual operation and maintenance is gonna be probably millions, right? Um, so where we're at, um, fish-friendly turbines aren't yet at that scale, right? And that's the problem, it's a timing mismatch. Uh, they're building them, there's a couple companies, uh, Alden has one, uh, this group Natal is kind of new on the scene, they have built one, um, they just haven't scaled it up yet. And the sad part is if you go out to the dam, both OPG and NIPA are replacing one of those turbines a year. And I sit there and it, it damn near cry looking at it because you know it's an, it's an opportunity lost that that's going to be there for my lifetime, right, once it's installed. So essentially it's a mismatch, but you'd think at some higher level, right, we, we get together as the EPRC, a bunch of eel biologists in a room fighting over this and all passionate, and at some point we need something bigger, right? You'd think that at some level if there was high level staff there and said, hey, here's what we're looking at for reality if these guys are successful is hundreds of millions of dollars and millions in O&M costs that that would prioritize that, right? Um, but it just isn't happening, right? There's arguments against it, that there's hydropower uh, loss. They say there's 5% loss for some of these turbines, fish-friendly turbines, but you start looking at cost and I don't know what that matches up, right? But there's, it should be a wash in my opinion. Um, so that's the sad answer, I guess. Best of my abilities. But good question, uh-oh. Let's hear it. <laughs> um, what did you say the numbers are on the uh, commercial What's your um, count heading, heading upstream? So they're, they range between 20 and 50,000 a year. Yeah. And during obviously high water, there's another mm -hmm. issue, right? That during high water years, the, when they spill water through the South Channel, um, that kind of uh, uh, guides eels to that because they hear the water and want to climb there. So you'll see those counts are way down. We see a little bump the following year um, or later that year when they close the, the dam, um, but it's, uh, it's not good. The Quebec fishery, just alone. Yep. So part of the, so we have a FERC process, right? And that's what kind of beat on NIPA to get the funding that, that funds the FEMREF. In Canada, they have a different process and you know, um, it's essentially the utilities are under the crown kind of thing, right? So. They address, uh, they have some responsibilities under the Fishery Act, but they address um, species of concern with five-year action plans. So one of those action plans was buying out some of the commercial licenses in Canada. Um, so they were at 22%, I think it was, and they bought them down to less than 10. So we have 40% killed by turbines. 10% of those silver eels are uh, captured in the fishery, right? So we have 50% off the top that don't make it out. Uh, this thing I showed, uh, that was our work, so I could look it up. I don't know off the top of my head, but it was 26, 2016, 17, or 18, right? Because those tags wouldn't have lasted two years, so one of those years. 